getting these getting these up onto YouTube so people can look um, on that little that email announcement that comes out in the lower in the bottom of the email announcement. There's a uh, link to the YouTube recordings. Um, and the way we typically do this, they're like a show and tell format where people take turns sharing their recent mushroom finds from the greater New Jersey area. Um, you can either do that by sharing from your own screen or uh, you can email me your observations before this session and I'll share them from my computer. So I only have some from a couple of people tonight from three of us. Um, is there anybody else that has mushrooms that they would like to share? If you do just uh, either say so or type your name, preferably type your name in the chat and uh, I'll call on people in the order that they do it. Um, I figure once we run out of mushrooms, we could always try going on iNaturalist and doing some identification on there if people are up for that. So is there anybody that wants to kick off with any observations? If not, I will go right to my emails and we will start looking at what we have. So, All right, you wanna start Marisol? Okay. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. All right, so I went on Thanksgiving day to the woods in, in, the, in the Smithville. And then on Saturday, I went to Franklin Park. No, no Franklin Park, the Pine Barrens. Uh, there is a street called Suey Road and I found all sort of cool stuff. So uh, in the two places, I found the same, this yellow dusty um, fungus is called uh, um, Helicun auratum. I have found it uh, several times before. And I was very excited because it's such a gorgeous, beautiful fungus. It's an, it used to be called imperfect fungi. And it's an asexual stage, but I don't know of what, that I don't know. And you can see that it, it loves rotten wood, wet rotten wood. And um, it always has this golden yellow color. And the spores, when you look at the, this with a lens, you can see the spores because they are gigantic. They are three-dimensional. They are made out of a spiral and a hifa that is um, coiled in a spiral. And as um, I read in the book again, and it says they are hygroscopic, which means that they, are, that they absorb humidity from their environment. And when I put this on the slide, they uncoiled. And you'll see several photos. I was really fascinated uh, taking so many photos. Ah, on this one, you can see on the upper part, this little sticky tip is what attaches the spore to the conidia, which is like an erect brown hifa where this uh, spore is born. Mm, yeah. And you can see one that is still coil and the one that already started to fall apart. More. And it's kind of funny because uh, when they are uncoiled, they are kind of brownish with golden edges. And when they unfold, they become gold, golden in color, and then they are transparent. I don't know if they lose something when that happens. Like there is one on the middle right. Middle, aha, uh -huh, it's almost, uh, it almost lost all the color. And you can see in different, in different sports how it changes the color. It's really fascinating. <laughs> Uh, it has a maybe the wrong uh, the right name is not spore, but it's easier for me to say that. It's probably called a conidium four. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the correction. 
and the fruiting bud is always so tiny, like one inch <laughs> or even less. Yeah. It's, if you don't know what you're looking for, you will miss it. <laughs> but, if, but I, I am looking for cross fungi, so I always, and now I know it, so I, I say, Ooh, this one is probably the, the one, Helicuna auratum, and it was. Okay. This right. wood was a, in, in a bug against peat moss. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, very cool. Yeah. Maricel, is that coiled up thing? Is that one conidium or is that? It's one. Like several no, no, it's one. It's one. That's a single conidium. It's a single, yeah. Wow. That's the, and you, that's, you, huh? you said you can see it with a. Yeah, um, with the lens. With, with, with like a loop. I mean, with a loop. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah you see wow, them like, that's amazing. Like, like grains, yellow grains, of course, really oh, tiny. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. big are they? Did you measure one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I mean, I don't have the measurement here. I have it in my observation. The, the measurement oh, okay. maybe, oh, maybe not. They're gigantic. I didn't put the measurements yet. Can you look? No, I didn't put the measurements yet. No. Okay, that's all right. Facebook. They're huge. If you can go on the picture of the fungus and look. When you go close, you can see like sand more you can see them look this is granule like yellow rice i mean smaller than a grain of rice but it's just the idea in below that little branch look can you point below that little piece of root below right, right there in that area you can see yeah yeah yeah, yeah. below it below it. Uh -huh. right there All right, very cool. This is on the underside of a log? Yeah, 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 you always have to turn it, yeah. Okay, so this one was in, in Sui Road, which is in the Pine Barrens. And this one was also in the Pine, Pine Barrens. This was on Saturday. And I didn't know what to make out of this one when I found it. It was buried under the pine needles. And when I took it, when I took it out, it thought it was a Cortinarius because it has a like a, a white base you'll see in the photos can you show please very pale show to see them yeah it has an enlarged base and when i did the micro it, it is an hebeloma it reveals to be a hebeloma and i was looking on some options it could be undatum it happens in New Jersey. I was looking in some book. And it has the calocystidia that it, um, in another photo. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was just going to ask, because yeah. that's one way you can tell the difference between Hebeloma and Cortinarius. Uh, I yeah, think I most courts don't have calocystidia. I'm pretty sure I you know, oh, I might want to double check that. Yeah, I don't know they, that. Or they might I... have some, but they're like really small. Yeah, oh. those look like Hebeloma, uh, mm -hmm. Kyla Cistidia. Yeah, yeah, very good. This is my second time that I scope uh, Hebeloma, and that's how I knew that it was, because I remember the, the one I did that I found in my work, and in the garden at work. Oof, I will never forget that Kyla Cistidia. I look like, like spoons to eat ice cream, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the humpback, like the almond shape, but humpback spores. Oh. Okay. A lot of times, Hebeloma has spores have that shape. In fact, I can't remember really seeing any anything much different than that. Okay, that was a cool find. I, yeah, and there was only one, just one, uh, uh, close to the base of a white pine. And yeah, the, and the uh, and the. The gill color is sort of like coffee with a lot of cream in it. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did this have a smell? Did you notice? I smell it. Let me see what I wrote here. But they said that it's only like a fruity smell, but it didn't look, it didn't smell too fruity. Let me tell you what smell was that if I wrote it. Mm, there, it's, no. This, no, Ginopilus, no, 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 no. I didn't write that about the smell. 
Nope. No notes. Nope. Yeah. Right. But it was a cool thing to find. Yep. All right. This is in the same place. There is a little creek next to Route 70 with Sui Road. And in, I walked along the creek. And I found two types of gallerina. The, the more common gallerina marginata or autumnalis, as Luke told me that is a synonym. And this one. And I have been looking at books about gallerinas, and I know this one is a gallerina too, although I don't know which species it is yet. But it has the same thing. Um, it looks a little different on the cap because it has it's marginated, and but it has the same features here on the cap. I mean, I'm sorry, on the stipe. The little ring with the brownish spore deposit. But most of the small gallerinas that grow in moss don't form um a really okay. distinctive ring like this you'll oh. get like ring zones or just oh. partial veil material that sort of spread across the the stem mm -hmm. so so that you might be able to figure this one out because these guys are yeah. really hard these little mm -hmm. gallerinas yeah and i put this photo uh, showing you the how crazy the size of the spores are there was one gigantic and then the other one's more regular like most of them were medium sized, but this one has this humongous one right there. So I put all the measurements. Maybe the measurements are not in my observation yet, but I have them in my note, notes here at home. And, um, oh, and another thing in this um, gallerina, the, the Calocystidia was pointy with this long neck like, and it also has bifid, like two tips, as you can see where I put the number one. And I found two in the preparation that I have. There is another photo with that. We are beefy end. Can you show the other photos, please? Another one right there. Ma Maricel, I, I have um, mm -hmm. a book just on Gallerina. I think it might be a like an internet type thing that I can just send you a link. Please I'm, do. I'm not sure I'll yes. have to check. Yeah, it's, oh, it's like you. there's so many species in it, it's ridiculous. Oh, geez. It's pretty distinctive. <laughs> now, oh, okay, are you, yeah. Are you sure that you didn't possibly get a couple of Hebeloma spores um, mixed oh, in with no. these guys? Oh, no? no, I have each specimen mm -hmm. specimen by itself. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is the, the one that, that I'm showing. Big, really big spore looked a little like a Hebeloma spore, but that's oh. unusual. That's unusual that, that you would get such... A, a, a discrepancy in spore size because one of the ways they segregate mm -hmm. um, genus Gallerina is according to spores from like eight to 11 and, and spores that are bigger than that. Mm. Um, or it might be 10 might be the cutoff. Um, oh. Yeah, so, so this okay. would be interesting if this had these really two. But you know what? I think I remember reading on a few of the species mm -hmm. where the Bacidia that have two stagmata will make big spores ah. and the best city with four makes small spores. So that might be what's going on here. And, 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 and inter thank you, Dave. An interesting thing that I found, I did the, the micro of the Gallerina marginata, and then I did the micro of this little one and the spore from this little one are bigger than marginata. I was surprised because marginata was gigantic and and the cap was five centimeters in diameter. And this guy is like one point something centimeters. It is one centimeter. Wow. Yeah, yeah, got the, the marginata has yeah. Yeah, marginata right. has some of the smaller spores. They're usually under 10. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And also another thing you want to check with gallerina spores. Mm -hmm. Try to try to evaluate whether or not they're very close or not, whether they're like ornamented or not, because that's okay. another feature that helps you nail the ID. Okay. Some are and some aren't. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're looking at clamps here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the Calusis tedia. The very close to the other one, to the oh wait, because I didn't show the other gallerina. I'm so sorry. Okay, forgive me. All right. And it's a little blurry here, but it's at 100x just to show you how 
many of them are sticking up on the upper part of the gills, which will make them the chaos is tedia. Is, is that one the, the marginata, the last one? No, 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 this is no, okay. about this one. Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. The one centimeter cap, I can't believe it, yeah. So now these last two observations, I went to, on Thanksgiving, I went to Smithfield and I wanted to be on the conifers. And there is an area there where there are a lot of conifers. And white pine and another one that I don't know the name, but it's a conifer. So I found this on the ground, but when I pull it out, it's attached to cubic rot. Now I, I remember there were cubes of brown wood and they were attached by this white mat as you can see in the picture. Can you make that bigger, please? Look. The, you see the white mycelium at the base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a little bunch of them growing um, in, in a little spot, but each one of them has its own um, white mat at the base. And you can see some scales on the side. It's uh, igrophanos, which means that the cap uh, has fading colors. You can see one is almost like white, creamy. And it has some striations on the margin of the cap. These lines, radial lines. And when I did the micro, I had no idea because I never found anything like that. The, the gills are spaced and attached, but a little with a little the current piece. I can't say that. I don't know how to say that. What's the name for that, Dave? The current tooth. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks. So you did the micro on this? I did. I did. It's coming. Yeah. I wonder how you did you consider to barium? No, because I don't know. I don't know those things. I don't know too many little LBA. Yeah, I re go through to Baria for Furatia, to Baria, I think it's Himalaya or Himalaya uh, yeah. or something. Yeah, but Himala. some people, some people propose to Baria, but it's not to Baria. It's something else. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I got a name. So you can see them, come back to the, the previous micro. It has these weird um, clams and inflated hifa at the septa. So on the top, you can see the clam connection. And on the lower, towards the right, you see that constricted or inflated hifa. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think there was no calocystidia or anything like that. I could not get a spore print, and I got the spores. Look at the spores. Yeah, those those don't look like tubaria spores. Tubaria see, spores have a weird color. shape, like a sort of like a kite or something oh, but but yeah. not not like not not angular mm -hmm. um and and tubaria you can usually find a lot of chylocystidia they're no, they're usually just like filaments or they're really really oh. thin and and and, and, and so they call it flexuous i think because they're like oh. wiggly mm -hmm. um but you can usually find them pretty easily um so if you didn't find any chylocystidia no. and these spores look more like Quernomyces to me. See, actually. that's what they proposed. Yeah. Quernomyces and yeah. uh, Nicola because it was growing on wood. Lignicola is, is, is one of the fibers in the wood, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, but yeah. I think they all grow on wood um, or um, at least woody debris. There's also Quernomyces, um, uh, the one that's in the spring, it used to be Foliota veris. Um, Mar uh, it might be marginatum or something like that. That one's in the spring though. But there's another one too. There's there's Cornomyces. Oh, I forget. There's there's a third one. They all grow on wood though. They all grow on woody. Oh, stuff. I didn't know that. Okay, I had to find. But this doesn't things. this doesn't look like that other one really. This is like smaller, and okay. the gills look a little different. And then I found another one in the same area, very close. So I was looking for crusts and there was grass under 
white pine and another kind of conifer. And I start moving the grass when I saw this super tiny stick. And there were these five or six super tiny um, mushrooms growing on it. And then I put it in uh, advanced uh, mushroom identification group and Alan Rockefeller and Christian Schwartz uh, immediately said that they recognize it. But it's, an, it's not in um, Albogenopilus nanus. And I went to their observations and it looks like that and the micro matches. But it's not a published name yet. So I could not even put that name in there. So they, I asked help to Christian and he just named it Genopilus for the moment. And uh, he asked me for the, the mushrooms to do the DNA. And I said the next time I find them because I threw them in the garbage. I was so mad. And look at that. They have um, very set, um, uh, spaced gills. They're super tiny. And uh, they are white on the top, on the cap. And they get this um, nice color on the gills. And the spores are dark. You see all the features. And it has the weirdest calocystidia and the other type of cystidia. It's capitate, but also has as, um, inflation on the middle and at the base. You'll see in other photos, I took plenty. Mm. Oh, that's the basidia and the color of the spores. What, what are the spores mounted in? In, uh, what's the name? KOH? In no, in Congo. But they, they oh, have okay. color. You could see that on the gears before I did the preparation. And you can see the capitate ends of the calocystidia and the belly. It has like a belly and then it go, changes and narrows down, down towards the base. And there are some of them have three bellies. It's really something. Uh, this is what I can't remember what oh, I don't know what is this for. Oh, the clamp, clamp, yeah. Clamp connection, yeah. yeah. Oh, here on the top, and right top, there is one that has two of these inflations close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never saw anything like that. It was so cool. Oh, and this one, look at how inflated this one is in the right. And one on the left has the one and two inflations. Yeah. It was really cool to see this little mushroom. So, so far, there are no other observations that from the West about I, this. I wonder if these have dextrinoid spores oh. because gymnopolis have dextrinoid spores. Oh, I so don't know about that. If, yeah. yeah, if you mount them in melters, oh. they're the color gets really bright and a little bit purplish. Mm. But you that's on see... Gymnopolis. Yeah, Albo Gymnopolis literally means, I think, like a white Gymnopolis. Mm -hmm. Because the cap is very white. Because I was surprised. Yeah. yeah, when you first said Gymnopolis, I was kind of scratching my head yeah, yeah. when you showed that. They call it Albo Gymnopolis. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen this mushroom before. This mm -hmm. is a really interesting find. Yep. Who, who gave it that name, I wonder? Who made that provisional name? Uh, Christian. Christian Schwarz. Okay. And, and Alan Rockefeller has an observation in Mushroom Observer, and Christian has his own site with a photo of it. Huh. How, big is, they, how big are the caps? The biggest cap? Oh, how gosh. Big? Like, let me see my paper. It's super tiny. Let me see my paper. Let me see my paper here. Uh, Albony, blah, blah, blah. 26, 23, 23, 24. Now, don't have measurement that is not even a centimeter. It was super tiny. That's oh. good enough. Less than a centimeter. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's enough information, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. So was this, I, I don't remember, did you say um, uh, deciduous wood? It could be, it could be a little uh, white pine stick. It could white be, pine. but I will never know. Yeah. Unless I find it again. Okay. Right. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. If we have time at the end, I can show the Galerina because it was really something too. 
at the end. All right, thanks. Cool. Thank you, Marisol. All right. All right. So Dave. So I don't know. I wasn't here last week. So I don't know. Did you guys look at Dave's stuff last week? There are there are two of them. That yeah, we, we did. Don't have to go. Yeah, we don't have to spend a lot of time on those two. I have a lot of things here because I anticipated there might not be much submitted, but we can look at as much as I can if we want to come back for some more later. That would be okay. But if you start on the top, um, on the top of the ones that you said you thought you looked at last week, I thought. Uh, we can start with this. This is one that we looked at last week. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Start up there. Yeah, anywhere you want to start is fine. Uh oh, my internet connection is unstable. It says, or is that, or is that yours? So this thing here, these are really small, little jelly-like things, um, more like little pieces of rubber, actually, and. Um, you really need to get a picture and and blow it up to to make any sense out of it. Um, so that's sort of what they look like. They're really small. These are only a millimeter or two, maybe three millimeters at most. And um, there's another picture where I took a, a couple of photos through a loop. Big idea here. So this is apparently it's an anamorph of something. <laughs> and um, um, I actually found some spores. I managed to or conidia, I guess. I managed to squeeze out a few conidia from trying to smash mount one of these things, but they're not very cooperative when you try to smash mount. By the way, these little globular things are these gray things. That's probably like Ogala epidendrum. So that's a pretty common slime mold. I, I don't want to really talk about that one, but um, um, you can see here what these things look like. <laughs> they're, they're on a piece of wood. And according to the person who suggested the idea on Mushroom Observer, um, she said she finds this a lot. And I, it's one of these really small things. And it's the kind of thing I only find when, it, when there's not much else out there. <laughs> and there wasn't that much out there this day. So I noticed these. So I was wondering if, if anybody knows. So these are the conidia. Um, if anybody knows, what what is this the anamorph of? So there should be some sort of telomorph, some sort of other fungus um, that this is at, at a different phase of its life cycle. Uh, but I was just wondering if somebody might have an idea. Uh, I couldn't find anything. Um, I, I looked on all kinds of online sources and couldn't really find anything. Yeah, the sport picture is not great. You can see here, they're they're pretty pretty hard to see. I did mount this in a in a stain, but these these conidia didn't really pick up the um, the stain very well. So why do you think it's an anamorph? Uh, that's what I was told. Okay. It is a, that it's an anamorph of something. It is. It's um, an imperfect fungi. Yeah, it's a, yeah imperfect fungi. Right. Um, yeah. But so, I don't know which one is the sexual uh, form of it. And I found it very often in very wet and rotting wood. Yeah, it was really wet, rotting wood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they corticated too. Yes, no, no bark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you exactly can see that. Like the the wood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it was a pretty cool thing to find. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I wish I could have got a little further with microscopy, but I just, I don't know. I, I, my patience runs a little thin when I try to make a section with a razor blade and this kind of thing just keeps like flying off the table because it's slippery and dense. So I tried to smash mount some of it and that didn't work, but I got some spores squeezed out at least. Uh, Dave, one time when I found it and I didn't know what it was, I noticed that they look like molars. Yeah, oh, like molars. Teeth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they look good. like molars. <laughs> <The> molars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do. And and another thing, I didn't know anything about oh, it, and that. I squeezed, <laughs> I squeezed one, and a little egg came from the center. In oh, what in your photo, you have some of them empty. Oh, I see. I, They're like puckered. 
It's like and puckered the in the middle, and so the egg yeah. came out already. I yes. guess. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's really weird. Mm -hmm. In one of the photos, I see so in the lower part, there is one empty, like on the center, down yeah. on the center. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Hmm. Well, if I find it again, maybe I'll try to play around with it a little bit. Mm-hmm. All right. So what do we have? Let's see, I forget what I sent. Oh, there you go, Marisol, more gallerina. These were in moss, they're pretty big. I mean, when I say pretty big, I mean the biggest one um, has a cap that might be bigger than a wow. centimeter. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's actually, and the stalks are pretty thick. I did not work on a species ID for this. Maybe I will eventually, I'll have time now because I'm not finding any new mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see here how, uh, did this have a partial veil? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. But there are these deposits on the on the upper stem, so mm -hmm. there's um, oh yeah, okay, you can see here all these Kyloacidia. There, there's a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. Some of those might be Bassidia mixed in there too, but I think that's mostly Kyloacidia. Yeah, there. yeah, it's too yeah, long. So yeah, I didn't find any Pleurocystidia. Um, so there's another one. There's one that was sort of by itself, I guess. Um, and I also some of the images are labeled cap um, or, or stipe. Um, so I think that the things I found on the stipe are what you would call um, cholocystidia, but I'm not sure, you know, this, this, I, this business of what's the difference between a cystidium and just, you know, hyphae, I'm, I'm not always sure I know. So- Oh, oh Dave. So here Dave. is- yeah, yeah go ahead. you can see it in this picture. Yeah, so I think these are are cholocystidia from the mm -hmm. sky. Yeah, I think that's what those are. They they're in bunches. They're pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, so so you're confirming then that I'm right about that. You think that these are cholocystidia? May I say something? The, yes, go ahead. Okay, so I have several photos of uh, this my type of um, cystidia from the stipe, and yeah. you can see that the fibers or the hifa on the stipe run vertically. And yeah, then they, yeah. this cystidia is, is runs like almost transversal. And sometimes they yeah. are inclined. It's like it, the hifa has to modify itself to get the shape, they're twisted. Yeah, but it's a differentiated bunch of uh, these things. You are right. It's a differentiated type of hifa. Yeah, also okay. these are like almost subcapitate. So that that tends to make me think they're cystidia, not just hyphae. You no, know, they are. They are, and they have a, a and the ends are, yeah. Yeah, are yeah, they're they're defined. enlarged. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. ends are enlarged and rounded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave, okay. some, yep. sometimes the spores on um, some of the ones that grow in a swamp, the gallerina who grow in a swamp, uh, they they have what called a flange, is it? It yep, looks, I've seen it. Yeah, a covering. And mm -hmm. it's, there's a couple that have a covering and it, like the, um, the Tibetans, Tibetans does not have a covering, but the Spagmolian, and there's another one, a Palasta, I think it's called, they both have a flange. So Yeah, so there's, a, there's a few of them that have that. Yeah, it's, so look it's at like the a, it's, it's like it has a jacket on or something. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. And sometimes what like part? half of it falls off and you see half of it. Right. You're talking yeah, about some that. sort of veil? Uh, it, it's like a jacket around the spore. Yeah. Oh, the spore. oh, I get right. it. Okay. A lot okay. of times it looks like wings on the okay. one end. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. And um, this this guy didn't have that. The spores on this one were okay. pretty straightforward. And I, I think I made, I think I estimated spore measurements. So this I think was, is this still, does it, does the picture say, um stipe or cap because i also tried to to um mount a little material from the cap that's down a little further cap. um cap smash mount yeah okay so so i guess then these are probably pileocystidium because they're sticking out kind of you know mm -hmm. um and the, also they they are also some of them appear to be subcapitate so mm -hmm. i think they're not just hyphae they're probably 
pileocystinia. So these fetuses will, if I get around to trying to go through the um, uh, the book on Galerina, you know, maybe I can figure this one out. So that's from the cap. Dave, yes. do you suppose to work on the cystidia from the caps too, from Galerinas? Because I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, there, oh, you get, yeah, some of them have oh. and some of them don't. Oh, yeah. man, okay. There's so many species. The more information you can get, okay. the more likely it is you'd be able to narrow it down to. I see. Sometimes right. you can narrow it down to a section, you know, mm. with with presence mm -hmm. or absence. Um, okay. I don't know all of this information really well yet. I just I take them home sometimes and look at them in the in the early in the spring and in the fall, and mm -hmm. when there's really not much else to find. You know, I'll take some <laughs> yeah. of these home. <laughs> and and that's when they come out too. They come out in like mm -hmm. May and and October, November. Okay. So yeah. Oh, Sister Derma. Jasonis. It's not named after Tom Jasonis, though. Um, I asked him. <laughs> Anyway, um, so this looks an awful lot like cystoderma. I, I think it's called ammonianthium or something like that. Um, so it's very easy to, to not be able to tell the difference. Um, but when you look at the spores, um, this cystoderma jasonis has really big spores. And the spores are amyloid. And these spores were really strongly amyloid. There's a, there's a, gen, a genus called cystodermella. Um, that makes mushrooms that also look a lot like these, and and but those are have spores that are not amyloid. Um, but when I say big spores, I mean almost up to eight microns, because Cystoderma ammonianthium, I think the spores are mainly under six microns. So, but otherwise, features that that really there's the melters on the spore print. You can see how dark it got. Um, that little black area there, that's the drop of Meltzer's on the white spore print. Um, the other thing is, too, the upper stalk is kind of purplish above the, um, the, the veil deposits. It's kind of, that's, that's a Jasonis um, trait. So, but it's really the spore size that I was able to nail this one because of that. That's beautiful, Dave. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Oof. Pretty cool mushroom. It's, it's a yes. moss mushroom. Uh -huh. These were found, I think, pretty close to... Um, to those gallerinas, I believe. Okay. Maybe away. Are they related with moss? Yeah, they grow in, most cystoderma grow in moss. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if they're mycorrhizal with moss or, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I forget if they're mycorrhizal or sap probes. Or... And these have, if you do a close up on the cap here, you'll see that it's, it's sort of minutely scaly or sort of broken up into these little grainy scales, um, little bumps sort of. Um, so white spore print for these, you know, you shouldn't eat these. Uh, they're probably probably poisonous really. They're small anyway, nobody would really be interested. You find like three of them and that's a lot. Um, what, what, so what anyway, yeah, the pictures came out pretty good, so. What reference are you using to figure these out? Uh, it's Quebec. Oh, okay. Oh, no, you know what? I, oh, wait, no, wait a second. I may have got this one off Mushroom Expert. I use both of those a lot. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I, if I just expert. sit here on my computer, I go back and forth between those two. And I'll usually have Baroni's book here by me as well. And sometimes I'll get, get up enough motivation to get off the couch and grab a few more books. But this one I found online. I see. It might have been Mushroom or... Expert. Oh, yeah. used references, both of them. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Oh, here you go, Luke. I believe this next one's going to be a polypore. And, um, oh, Becky, that's her name, Becky, right from Cloverdale, uh, Cloverdale uh, County Park. She thought she knew what this was, and, and it was she got it from one of your observations, actually. There's your there's your observation reference, 4444, four, 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 
three zero. And I think I actually even put a link in someplace for that observation. It may be in a comment that I made. Oh, there What's it is. The yeah, it's a link. If you if you click on that link, Luke, you'll see yours. Uh, the name. Right there. Um, right there. Oxyporus cuneatus. Yeah, Oxyporus. Yeah. So you know the funny thing is, if you look in polypores of the Pacific Northwest, um, this species is described. And it's it's not it's it's not like this. It's the 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 pores are really small, like three per millimeter or something like that. So yeah, there's you know yeah, what the, yeah that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the first time that I have used a reference for a, a West Coast reference and found a description of a species that's completely different than what my understanding of, of that species here in the East. And I think there's probably been quite a few instances where the names have been applied differently on the Eastern part of North America and the Western part of North America. So that might be what's happening here. Right, because I was using North American polypores for this one. Is that the Bisset book? Uh, no, the Rivarden book. Yeah, I'm going to get uh, the Bisset book is on the way. I'm, I'm going to get it. Maybe can it'll I, be in there. Can I have the name again? Like I can't see it. Oxyporus what? Wait a minute. I'll move it till you can see it. Right Cuneatus. there. Cuneatus. I think that I have found this few times. I could never know what it was. I'm pretty sure we sent this off to be sequenced. Uh, oh. Then it came back with that and name? it matched. And no. so, if it matched sequences in GenBank, it may have matched one of those things. From yeah, West. I'm just. That's I'm, weird. I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting on. I guess Igor still has this stuff that we just haven't uh -huh. seen it yet. <laughs> so I did not find this. Somebody found it on. Um, it was a. It was a walk that Nina led, and I was there. John was there. We all split up, and we, the people all split up, and somebody found this. And I had assumed it was, excuse me. Yeah, I had assumed it was it was found on pine because we were in an area that was mostly pine with oaks mixed in, maybe a few other hardwoods. Um, but I think Luke, you had said on on yours that it's found on cedar. But so there were some swampy areas near the near the lake. So maybe somebody found it on on cedar, you know, and I just didn't know. So, but it looks like yours, that's for sure. Yeah. So I don't. I, On the yellowish. Yeah, the top is yellowish, and the bottom okay. is is these are these um, pores with uh, coming off of the elongated tubes. Cool. And yeah, it's yellowish on top, sort of. Mm -hmm. This was small too. These were, these were you know under an inch. These two, two sort of caplets were each under an inch, or maybe an inch. I think I wrote down here how big they were, but they were small. Yeah, so I just thought I, even though that was viewed last week, I think, I don't know, because I I, I, didn't, I I couldn't come on last week, but I just sent a few, uh, I sent those two observations because I thought they were pretty interesting. That that anamorph thing and, and this one, so. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a interesting thing to look at. I didn't get any spores out of it. Okay. Yeah, keep moving on down for as long as you want. Ah, so here's a species that's sort of new, a fairly new species. It's documented on the uh, Quidex site. So it's similar to Croceus, but I think the spores are a little bit bigger than Croceus. And also it has an umbo. It has a pretty distinct umbo most often, as you can see on some of these. Uh, and maybe it's a little browner, especially on the disc, than Cortinarius Croceus, which I believe is, is qualifies to be in subgenus Dermosibi. Um, but I find this every year in the same place, in the fall, if it, if it had not got real cold, as it's been cold where I live, we've had a morning that was 18 degrees, um, I, I would still be finding it. I, I, I could go and find more of these, but I'm sure they're all gone by now. So it's a cool little mushroom. It's probably poisonous. Um, 
And the spores are almost up to like 10 microns, which is a fair amount bigger than um, Crocius. So that's one of the differences also. I didn't look at any um, any gill material or anything. Uh, it, when Cordinarius does have cystidia, they're usually really small and hard to see at 400. So I just don't bother usually. Yep, yeah, under pine, I think it's Scott's pine where I find these every year. Okay, I guess you can move on. There's not much more to see there. So Penny, the book that he was talking about was the uh, Poly 4 book that the, the sets just put out. Oh, I found some more Neolective. Same, same place I found it last year. And I looked again at spores and it, so it appears to be once again, the elective Fidelina and I saved them. So these are pretty cool. I, I think John and Nina told me that they have found this in the Pine Barrens. I'm not sure. Um, Nina, are you there? Okay. Just a cool little thing to find. Grows, on, grows under pines. So. This is a very primitive fungus. It's, um, there's only two species known in North America, um, Vitalina being the one and the other being Irregularis. The one that's in most field guides is Irregularis. Well, it's not in most field guides, but it, the species that sometimes appears in the field guide is irregularis. And, um, but these are vitalina. The spores are a little smaller, I believe, irregularis. I think the spores go up over 10 microns. And there's other, the asci are different as well. I didn't take any pictures of asci this time. Last year I did. Those are the, that's the more or less the environment. Um, so it's the edge, it's sort of where this Scott's pine stand peters out and mixes in with some hardwoods and then transitions into a, an oak forest. Um, a pretty cool thing to find. They're very primitive from what I understand on the evolutionary scale. Um, so that's them. Are those hollow or are they solid throughout? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I should, I should have sectioned one of them. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think I said so either there. I, they're really small. Um, so, so I don't know. Here's, here's more Gallerina. Dave? Uh, yes. Back to the one you were talking, the yellow one. Yeah, uh, the Neolecta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Neolecta. Somebody found one and was asking for identification and I found a link like yesterday or the day before. And yeah. they were mentioning that it's a very primitive, um, which means that it hasn't changed too much. Oh, that's what that other. means. Uh -huh. oh, it so has not evolved. Ancient. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. oh okay. Oh, well, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. So okay. more, more Gallerina or Gallerina, <laughs> okay. you know, either way is fine. Now, the interesting thing about this bunch was these were growing on a lawn. I never find these on lawns. They're always in um, moss. But you know what? There's a species I remember running into when I was trying to identify uh, Gallerina maybe last spring or last year, I forget, that grows on bare ground, it was reported. So maybe that's what these are. I haven't got around yet to really trying to put a name on these. But there's a couple of pretty cool pictures here. I got a couple of close-ups that that are pretty nice. Uh, I think these have a partial veil. I think you can sort of see on this picture here, where you know there's a little bit of organized sort of deposit on the stipe and, and some clinging to the cap. That would, would have been the last photo. Um, these are really small. You can see how small they were from the first photo with the penny. Um, the coin mixed in there. And so what kind of spores did they have? These have, I forgot. Um, Gallerina spores do not look all that different from Hebrew spores, to be honest. They, a lot of times they have that sort of almond shape, maybe a little bit 
um, it, you know, a little bit humpbacked, sort of like these. I guess these are, these look like they're up to about 10 or 11 microns, just up top of my head. They, here. Yeah. Do they, I read somewhere that mm, the pedicel, which is the tip that connects to the basidia, I mean, through the stigmata and the basidia, is eccentric. Oh, okay. For for all gallerina? No, no, no. In this case, they look like that. No, oh, I don't okay. know all that, yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good clue. Yeah, that's a good trait to notice. Um, this triangular thing here in the upper right is just a piece of debris. Um, so I think the photo here shows some some chylocystidia. These are on the gill edge. Um, so this one that's the pointer is pointing at right here. That's clearly not, that's not a bacidium. So that's a chylocystidium. So I thought it was just cool to find these on grass. Um, but I didn't find a lot of cystidia. Although I'm not really sure. This photo right here is ambiguous to me. I don't know if, if you blow that one up, Luke, I'm not sure if I'm, if we're looking here at cystidia or bacidia. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe some of each. It looks basidia. Yeah, it looks like basidia, but sure sometimes basidia. sometimes chylocystidia look like basidia too. So it, it can be kind of tricky. But I think they're probably basidia. That 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 was my guess when I mm -hmm. first saw them. Because there's so many of them look they're like all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, and they all look kind of the same club shaped. So they're probably basidia. Or basidials, maybe. Um, basidia that did not, that produced a spore. Okay, oh, so what There else? are some basidia that do that? Yeah, basidials, they call we, them. We never mature? Yeah, they, they just don't produce spores. Wow. So, yeah, that could be, they can be troublesome too when trying to evaluate cystidia huh? on, on the I gills. never heard that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, basidials. Now, I don't know. That might be an old term. I, I thought I, it was I meaning, don't see it get used a whole lot. Mm. I thought they were meaning immature basidia. Maybe, may, oh, maybe, maybe they're just immature. Okay. okay, okay, that might that might be it. I'm sorry, you might be right about that. They might just be immature best. Okay, I'll look that up later. Okay, so Rhodocolibia butyracea, it's easy to confuse with um, gymnopus. Um, species in the Dryophilus group, which is section lev leva something, lev levi levitipes or something. But one way you can tell the difference is the spore print from Rhodocybe uh, butteracea is very pale pink. And look on the black, doesn't it look white? That looks white, doesn't it? Look to the right on the white. You can see the pink tinge. And this is a good example of why you want to, if you take spore prints, you want to take on black and white. And sometimes people will say, well, you take it on black so that if it's white, you'll see it. Yeah, well, you can certainly see it, the white, uh, what looks like white on the black here. But if you look on the white part, the white strip, you'll see that it's actually very pale pink. So that's just a little lesson there in evaluating spore color. But you need a pretty thick print too sometimes before you see pigmentation like this. So a really, really thin print might might not show up very well at all on the white. So it's a little bit tricky. But the cap feels like butter. It's 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 like oily, slippery, a greasy. And usually the gills on Rhodocolibia butteracea are usually kind of jagged, serrated. I think if you if you zoom in on this picture, you might be able to see that um, on, on at least some of the gills. Let's see if, if not. Maybe there was another picture. I think this is the one where you can see. Yeah, you might have to move around a little. That's uh, a little bit. You can oh, see there it. we go. Here yeah, you can, you see, can it. see it. Yeah, here you can see it. Yeah, the gills are pretty jagged. The edges are pretty jagged. So. Usually I find these in the fall under conifers. This was um, on a lawn between a really big spruce and a really big white pine. Hey, so quick, 
quick question on that uh, spore print technique there. Yeah. Uh, did you be like, uh, how did you get the black and white? Is it the... Uh... Well, a friend of mine who makes signs for a living, um, who works for a company, he has access to all sorts of materials. And he took a piece of hard, pure white plastic, and then he took high grade black electrical tape and used the black electrical tape to make strips on the white plastic. And I've had that thing for, boy, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. So, yep. So I can lay a whole bunch of mushrooms on it. Um, you know, and I, every time I lay a cap on it, I just straddle black and white. No, that's good if, idea. If you, if you, one of the problems with taking sport prints is finding a, a really good surface to collect the, the print on. If you use like regular white paper, it, it, it absorbs the moisture and it pulls moisture out of the mushroom and that can affect the way the print looks. The moisture can stain the paper and you, you think you have like a light brown print, but it's just a stain. So, so it's, it's, you know, one thing you can do is just take a spore print on a microscope slide and then put the slide over black paper or white paper. But then it's a little hard to evaluate color sometimes because the, the slide glares a little bit, you know, so, but that the easiest way that I can evaluate color is the way that I just showed, you know, directly on those black and white strips. Some people take prints on aluminum foil, uh, but that can be a little bit deceptive also, especially if it's a really pale print. And then I noticed too, if you're doing it on aluminum foil, and then you try to scrape spores off to do a, um, a slide. You get all these little pieces of metal shards in there. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why when I ask people to send me, sometimes I'll, I'll if I get into a discussion on a, online about uh, an identity of a mushroom and they have some spores, I'll, I'll let people mail me spores and I scope them. Uh, but I always tell them, you know, try to get try to get some spores to drop on wax paper. You know, not on aluminum foil because of what you just said, Luke. Good advice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Canthro Lula. Oh, okay. So I figured after looking at all these <laughs> dermosities and gallerinas and, and so forth, it's time for something that's edible. And these are actually pretty good. Um, they, a long time ago, it was believed that these were related to chanterelles, and I think that's why the genus was called Cantharellula. Um, but I don't, I, I'm pretty sure they're not related to chanterelles. Uh, but if you see a close up on a gill, which I think one of the pictures that's coming up will be able to see that. Um, there we go. Look at how the gills are repeatedly forked. And so a lot of times there's veins in between too. So that's, that's what made people think, oh, these are like some kind of chanterelle. Um, but I'm not sure where they go in, into the phylogenetic tree, but I don't think they're all that closely related to cantharellus. Um, but they are good edible if you can Ooh. find enough of them. And this year, I made like three collections <laughs> that each collection, there were enough of them to add to a meal. And in fact, one time I, I had even more than what you saw in this observation. And I, I made them into two omelets um, for, for my wife and myself. And they were, they were they're really good actually, but it's hard to find enough of them. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll find two or three and they're really small, so, so what? Now, if you do collect something like this for the table, you have to make sure that you are aware of small species of Clytosabi, some of which are poisonous, um, and some, there's some small Mycenas that are questionable, some, some small Mycenas that are known to be toxic. So, so small white spore gilled mushrooms, you know, you have to make sure you really understand what, what it is you're, you're collecting, you know, if, if you want to try to eat them. And these hey, are big, these are I, big ones for the species. Yes. I would say, I thought mm -hmm. they were one of the better species I've ever eaten. They're really good. Yeah. Oh, these are really good. Yeah. They're in the, they're yeah, if in you the... find enough of them and they're big enough, you know, they're really good. 
and they're in the family Hygrophoraceae. Ah, uh, okay, that's it, right? Yeah. Yep, so I had forgotten. Yes, yep. kind of, kind I of do. related to the wax caps. That's yes, that's puts them in there. Yep, thanks. Steve, when did you find these? Um, I think the last collection of the last ones I saw were a few weeks ago. They will. You can. I continue to find these until it gets way too cold. Yeah, these are late. Yeah, you'll probably still be finding them down in the Pine Barrens, I would think. Although it is getting you a little cold around them, here. You can find them in, in in parts of New Jersey and maybe down around Philadelphia if you got the right kind of woods where it hasn't been too cold. It's been too cold up here. If we had a mild November, I would still be able to go out and get some of these. What trees does this grow with? And I'm sorry if you already said this. I walked in the room kind of while you were in the middle. No, of actually, I didn't it. say it yet. Uh, various conifers <laughs> generally, but always in moss. Yep. Okay. Yeah. These were near Scott's pine, but I've also seen them near spruce and other kinds of pines. Always in moss. Cool. Something to look for. I've never seen these before. Or if I did, I didn't know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just make sure you look, you know, you, you learn some things about some of the small cortosities. Another, oh, another edible. What do you know? Two edibles in a row. Another pine uh, mushroom, although I once found this under spruce, um, which was very unusual because the books will all tell you they always grow under pine, two and three needle pines generally. And so, once again, this is an edible mushroom, but this is one where you have to be aware of. Of, of other species that look very similar. So there's a, a pretty good variety of triculomas that have gray or grayish brown caps. Um, the caps on these are usually kind of streaked, radially streaked. Um, sometimes the gills will have a little bit of yellow here and there. Uh, sometimes there's a little tiny bit of like a purplish sheen on the cap of Triculoma portentosum. Um, but really, one of the main things you do, once you understand, you know, how to recognize mushrooms in genus Triculoma, um, the gray Triculomas that are inedible and or somewhat toxic, um, they're going to, they taste bad and some of them smell bad. So you take, you nibble a little bit. If it's, it, if it tastes bad, if it's bitter or like rancid flour or something, like whatever, the, like, I don't know if I've ever tasted rancid flour, but that's one of the descriptions that is sometimes put forth in, in guides. Um, then you know, okay, I don't have that one. Um, but these are really good. These are a really good edible mushroom along with Triculoma equestre, the one with yellow gills and a brown to yellowish or greenish yellow cap. Those are good also. Um, although in all honesty, I have to have full disclosure here. Um, the Triculoma species like Equestre in, in particular have been associated with some really, really serious illnesses that cause fatalities in, in Europe in Poland and France. Um, but in those cases, uh, people were eating so many of them that if there is some sort of toxin in them, it's, it's likely that the toxin does not affect you. It just passes through your body and you never, you never even knew it. Um, but there's a, apparently a tipping point. That seems to be the, um, the most reasonable explanation. Uh, the cases in Poland and France were, were all pretty much the same. People were eating like a quarter to a half pound a day for like five days in a row. And, um, and there was also a question as to how well cooked they were. And in one case, it was suspected that they were eaten raw. So um, just a little cautionary about Triculoma species. But on the other hand, Triculoma equestre is a very popular edible worldwide. It's been so for many, many years. So these deaths and, and really bad illnesses were seemingly like an anomaly, but um, there were some study done on, studies done on Equestre and some researchers believe that they had isolated a toxin and then they 
they thought they found the same thing in, in portentosin, which these gray ones are portentosin. So, so there's a little bit of a question about, you know, exactly what's in these trichilomas, but they call them around here, they call them Gunskis or Gunchkis, which is sort of a variation of a Polish word, um, Gunchki, I guess. Um, and Gunchki basically means trichiloma in Polish. So it's very popular mushroom around here. If you can find them, they're not that easy to find. Okay, so last one, it looks like. Oh, Mycena, Mycena griseo viridis. So Mycenas are really hard to identify to species. Um, but if I'm correct, and I'm not completely convinced that I am correct, as you can see, my confidence I proposed to my mushroom observer is 58%, is which means promising. But the thing that I, the things that I think um, distinguish this as Mycena griseo viridis are the gray frosty cap. You see the cap is gray. Now, now, a lot of the books will tell you that the cap is actually like olive green, olivaceous. I can see a tiny bit of that maybe towards the margin. But you see, it's a gray cap. It's got it's it's got what's called a bloom, this frosty appearance. Looks like flowers sprinkled on it, kind of. That's called, they call that a bloom, and the um, and the yellowish stem, or maybe it might be like a citron color stem. And they'll also tell you in the books that the gills are yellow or, or greenish. And I don't really see that on mine, which is, I guess, one reason why I'm not completely confident. But honestly, I'm pretty sure this is Mycena griseo viridis. It's a late season mushroom. It grows under conifers, pines, spruces. You can see there very well what I'm talking about here, the bloom. It's um, sort of the, just that frosty sort of appearance. Yeah, these were nice ones. They had the, the really cool um, uh, sort of the margin is all these little pointy things on the margin. And the spore size checked out pretty well. It was a little bit different than what's reported. And I think maybe, uh, where did I, where did I look? Probably, probably Quebec, maybe Mushroom Expert. I think these are just a tad bit smaller or bigger than, than the range, the expected range. Ah, but here's a good feature. These are um, hymenial cystidia. I think they're chylocystidia. I'm, I'm, I don't remember. But do you see how they, the, the end of the cystidium, if, if you zoom that, you can see it a little better, I think. It's not a great picture, but it's good enough, I think, to see what I'm talking about here. The end of the cystidium has this projection. It's like a finger sticking out of the end of the cystidium. So so it's the cystidium itself is just like this clavate thing. And then and then on the apex there's this long projection. And so the field guides and uh, will tell you that sometimes there's two projections like that. Now I didn't see any with two projections, but I did see several cystidia with the single long finger-like projection. And I think there's probably a few other species of Mycena that have cystidia that are like that. But if you put all these traits together, oh, there's oh, there's another one. Oh, that picture might be a little better, actually. You can see here this long finger-like projection on the end of the, the apex of the cystidia, cystidium. So the pictures are not the greatest, uh, but they're good enough to see what I'm talking about. Um, so if you put all these traits together, it pretty much adds up to Grisio viridis. And um, so um, I just brought this home to study. It was a nice collection. They were nice mushrooms, so I brought them home. Okay, I guess that's all I have. All right, thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Okay, so... I'm back on some of these stereums because I've been talking to that woman, uh, Sarah Duhan. She was one of those people that um, 
wrote that key, uh, that uh, paper last year on the Sterium Austria. Kind of piqued my interest in these things. So some of these observations I think I've shown already, but um, I've kind of like filtered out like these up here. These are all these species are the ones that they uh, call that what we used to call Austria. And I think she wrote somewhere. I just wrote that the actual uh, Sterium Austria is actually known from India, not from North America. I think that's what she told me. But anyway, this one, which I was the lobatium, Sterium lobatum, which they say is typically a flat cap and has a narrow base. So she was pointing out to me in here. Um, and maybe she doesn't point it out in here, but she, one of the things she says, so lobatum is one of the two of them that stain yellow like this. Subtomatosum and lobatum both um, stain yellow, but she says the lobatums tend to have the much more narrow base. Like I see how tight that base is. Um, Look. Yes. And also hairier cap than subtomatosum. Um, no, less hairy. Because she did the same thing to me. No, no <laughs> she less hairy. Less hairy. I don't know where she saw the hair. No, no, no oh, less. It's the other way. It's the other way around. So okay. if you look at these, these are more melt, uh, matted and felty. When you look at the, uh, see how like you can't really see any hairs like sticking up on them. I, I have some tomatoes, which I'll show. See how felty they look. So, so these, this one is what name? Lobatum. Lobatum. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which means lobed. Oh. Oh. And I think when they're saying lobed, they're referring to the fruit bodies when there's multiple of them like this. They're lobed like coming out like this. Like mm -hmm. they're really narrow at the base and projecting outward like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these ones stain yellow. And one of the other things about them is this is the one that quickly loses its hairs and reveals these bands of chestnut brown. Like if you look at that, there's no hairs there right where my cursor is, mm -hmm. right there. That's the context. So the obatum is the one that quickly recedes mm -hmm. into these bands. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then here's fasciatum. Fasciatum is the one that does not yellow. But this is clothed in coarse hairs that resist wearing off in bands. Luke, Luke, the ones that yellow, do you have to rub them or do you have to rub them with something that's wet? Or um, well, is there... when, when, they're, when they're really fresh, they yellow easily, like really easily. But um, when they're dry, I find if I lick them and then rub them, they uh, will yellow. Right. <laughs> That was the only one I spit on them. Yeah, yeah, spit and on them. And then the reaction appears. Yeah. So this <laughs> yeah. one, this is the fasciatum. So fasciatum is semicircular to funnel shaped. It's clothed in coarse hairs. So if you look at this one, see how hairy this one actually is compared to the mm -hmm. other one. And it's resistant to wearing off in bands. So if you look, this one doesn't have any of the, the hairs are like pretty uniform all the way through. And there's no yellowing. So you can see I was scratching it and I'm sure I was licking it too, but there's no yellowing. Luke. Yes. I'm sorry, look. I am so confused because I thought this one was Irsutu. <laughs> What's the difference with Irsutu? I don't know. I don't know that species, to be honest with you. Oh boy. Okay. Okay, we'll have to look into that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then. Here's one where I got lobatum and fasciatum side by side. I thought they were the same things, different ages, but she said sometimes, I think she said, uh, uh, you'll find as many as five species of sterium on the same log. <laughs> wow. So she pointed out in this one that this is probably, um, again, fasciatum. Mm -hmm. It's hairy, but it's not really wearing away. But that one's lobatum. See how, hmm. how shiny it is where all the hairs have worn away? Yep. And then 
this one here is side by side. So the one on the left, the shiny one is lobatum, and the one on the right is fasciatum. Mm. See how the, and I, I found these right next to each other. I assumed one was an old version of the other one, but she seems to, <laughs> she seems to think okay. she seems to think mm -hmm. because the one on the right is not showing any any of the wearing away the bands mm -hmm. that that's fasciatum. Is it possible to get spores out of these things? Um. Yeah. I mean, the yes. papers the papers all have spore dimensions on them. Yeah, that if you set one on a slide, can you expect some spores to fall on it? Or do yeah, you need to like, so. yeah, oh, okay. I wet them. I wet them and then I oh. put them overnight. Oh, so they revive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, oh, well, um, this is something I can look for at now that it's cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, and you, good, and, yeah. And you, Patrick Laycock, he looks a lot of sterium. He has a fair amount of microscopy notes on his thing that's on the micro guide. Yeah. This is the one that she said that she was pretty sure with cerium subtomatosum. So this one definitely is yellowing. You can see where my fingers were touching it. These were really fresh. Um, and this one should be hairier, although she pointed out that it looks like they're wet. And she said that sometimes when these steriums are wet, they're hard to see the hairs on them. And you have to bring them home and actually let them dry for a couple of days before you can really look at the hairs on them because the hairs will revive once they dry out. But one of the things oh. about subtomatosum is this wavy cap. See how wavy it is? Wavy? Right, right there. See, it's like yeah. up and down, wavy. Mm -hmm. And then you can see how broadly attached it is to the wood. It doesn't have those constrictions. Now she said they can, she said subtomatosum can be restrict, constricted too, but not always. And this is probably the more common way. Uh, you know, it's so confusing because I started identifying stereum subtomatosum based on Rivarden's book. He says that it's narrow at the base. Now it's not. Yes. Now they're saying that it's not narrow at the base. She said, but she, it's not she said it could be both. She, she said, oh. she said you have to be careful. She said you they can be restricted or. Oh, it's back too late. I know it's very, it is confusing. Oh. But look how much that's staining. That's just from me touching mm -hmm. it. Amazing. Now these were fresh back in August. So, so she said, again, she said, because these look like they were really wet. She, that's why she thinks they don't look so hairy. You would expect them to be hairier. Um, and again, her tip was actually, she said, put them in your pocket and forget about them for a couple of days. <laughs> so, so those are all three of them that we were calling Austria before last year. So, and then the other one I was looking at or these complicatum and, goss and gossipatum. And um, one of the things that she pointed out here is that almost every one of them that I was calling complicatum, she was changing to gossipatum. She says that gossipatum can be, even when they're dry, normally, normally when gossipatum is nice and fresh, it's the one that bleeds red. It's the one that you find on hardwoods that bleed red. Uh, you know, there's a different one that grows on conifers that bleed red, but gossipatum, when it's fresh, bleeds red, but as soon as it dries out, it no longer bleeds or stains. Uh, but she pointed out that they are, they tend to be thicker and hairier than complicatum. So these pictures are a little blurry. I assumed it was complicatum and I just kind of rapidly took a crappy picture of it and moved on. But you can see on here that they're a little bit hairier down around here. And in this one, you can see that they are a little bit thicker. See, they have like a little bit of a thickness to them mm -hmm. versus my other one. This one, she said, is definitely complicatum. And it's much thinner if you look at it. It's more parchment-like. That's the bottom. 
And when you look at the tops, they are pretty bald. That's complicatum. She said that that's complicatum. Yep. Yeah, that's the one I think is complicatum. That's yeah, yeah. But I no, don't no, know that they, they stain reddish. They don't stain reddish. That's what I'm saying. They don't. Gossipatum oh, okay. stains red. Complicatum yes. does not. But when mm -hmm. you find when you find gossipatum after it dries out, it's I always had a very hard time telling the difference between the, that and complicatum because, uh, no, because it no longer stains. And oh, but I don't believe it. I have done the same trick with the saliva and it stains. I have done it. Well, maybe it's, maybe to some degree, but I mean, I've, well, maybe, but she was pointing out, this is the, the point of what I'm trying to say here is, um, Complicatum tends to be the really thin one with no hair mm -hmm. or very smooth. And gossipatum, even when it's really dry, is hairy and much thicker. And can I say one more thing? Look, mm -hmm. this uh, esteron complicatum is so common. Esteron gausapatum is not. And you have to, it's more hidden. This so complicatum is everywhere. That, that's my assumption, but that's what I'm trying to say is she's telling me is not true. Almost every single one that I was calling complicatum, she's telling me is gossipatum. Oh. That's the whole point of my, my point here is I, oh. I, every time I see one of these that are kind of dried out, little mm -hmm. thinnish orange ones, I assume it's complicatum unless I can make it stain red and bleed. But she's telling mm -hmm. me that gossipatum is much more common than I seem to realize. And that I need to be a little more discerning, looking at how thick it is and looking at how hairy it is. Oh, I see your point. Okay, thanks. That's what she's. That's what she's telling me. Is mm -hmm. is complicatum more apt to be really bright, orangey yellow? Mm -hmm. Yep. It seems like and that. And it grows in big patches. Yeah, I've seen like logs with hundreds <laughs> of them. Yep. And underneath it runs just like across, no, with the edges. Yeah, yeah, and then mm -hmm. on the underside it'll be yep. resupinate. If you look, let's see if I can find. My internet's working slow right now. Sometimes you'll find gossipatum growing pretty prolifically too. See, like, look at that. that one? That's gossipatum. Yeah, I would have thought that was complicatum. So, so, when, so when you, yeah, when you, you look, just need to be careful in see, distinguishing. When you, right, when you look oh, at look it, the hairs. Yep. I see the, the hairs. Hair and the red. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So I wonder if um after it gets cold, if there's if there's a like a day where it warms up a little bit, these things probably revive, and um, you can probably make collections that are somewhat useful. Probably. Look how those those look kind of thick though. You know, I would wonder about these if I yeah. saw them. Yeah. I would wonder if they were if they were complicated because they do look kind of thick. They they do look thick. Yeah. Thank you, look, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I was happy with it. She mm -hmm. made my, I like it when somebody comes on to your observation, somebody that you know, knows her stuff and mm -hmm. really, uh, you know, put some useful information in there. Okay, cool. So Penny, I think you said you had some stuff to share. Yes, I do. They're uh, definitely not as esoteric as what you've shown. Well, let's see what you got. <laughs> uh, how do I find my... Now let me, let me see if I can find it. Um, so while you're looking for that, um, Penny, I wanted to say hi to Anna. We met, I met Anna at the, um, the foray a couple of weeks ago and she's, um, well, you want to tell us, Hannah, you're, you, you have a mycology club at your college? 
I don't want to put you on the spot, but I was just, you know, saw that you were sorry. Right. I had to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just started a mycology club at the community college in Mercer County. We've got about 20 members. It's very exciting. It's <laughs> huh, cool. So I, I, we're, we're talking about maybe um, next week or sometime in the near future, having the mycology club join us for a taxonomy Tuesday as like a guest, you know, you know, the, the, That'd club, be great. the club itself join us as, you know, our guest for the night and they can see what we're doing. So. That would be fun. Yeah. Would we all join as separate people in this Zoom or would we, I guess, yeah, that's the only way that it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, we would just send an invite to those people in the club. Awesome. So, but anyway, this is pretty much, usually usually it goes a little faster. Anna, we're taking our time tonight because there's only four of us. You can imagine during mushroom season when there's like 20 people wanting to share, we're like, we're zipping through these things really quickly. Oh, I can imagine. But tonight we're, kind, tonight we're just kind of like, you know, lackadaisically moving along. Yeah, so. nice. I would have shared my own things, but I wanted to join the first time and sit back and then maybe next time I will join in the conversation a little more. Yeah, cool. Anyway, glad you could make it tonight. Thank you. All right, what you got there, Penny? So can you can see that, right? Yeah. Can you, okay, so um, in my neighborhood, there was this white glob growing on a maple. Uh, and this is what it looked like. I took a picture of it a couple days in a row and I thought this might be a heresium. And then I was away for a couple weeks and I came back and this is what it looked like. So is that a heresium erinaceus? Yes, I would say it, this got a bit dry. That's why it looks like that. So it's old, but the That's spines old. are not very long. Is that I've seen pic people show pictures with much longer spines. It all depends on how much time it has to develop the teeth. Uh, I the spines, see. Uh, before it dries up like this. So it's very, it's, it's very, it's really not a very good uh, example because it, it looks like it dried out quite a lot before it fully developed. Okay. All I right. grow a lot of, I grow a lot of these. Oh, right. Well, this, this was, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So it was, I was surprised to see it in November. Yeah, and it's, they, they should be long gone, but uh, I've seen ones that's like literally frozen onto the trees. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a, a puff ball, small puff ball, like a Lycoperdon piriformi, I think, which I just saw uh, a couple of days ago in my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, it's already got the uh, uh, dark uh, inside, and so not edible anymore. And then here's the side view to show that the pear-shaped puff ball. Yeah, that would be like a pardon pyroform. Uh, oh, what did I say? Did you say perlatum? I don't know, but I meant to say no, pyroform. I, I meant to yeah. say pyroform. Yeah, I think that's what those are. They, that species ha doesn't have ornamentation that's as notable okay. on the top of the cap. But, but when they get old, the ornamentation can wear away. But these look more like pyroform piriformi or pyroform not sure how to say it really but another thing is see the white rhizomorphs on on the bottoms of the yes bodies yeah that's i think that's more of a pyroformy um uh, trait oh okay i think i'm not sure if they both have that but i know that pyroform does and usually i would find these on wood i think and yeah on, on a yeah. log but this was in wood chips under a under a tree. Now I have found what I call pyroform on, on wood chips, um, but you know there there might be more than one species um, oh. that 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 name gets applied to. Um, but I I don't even know how you would tell the difference. Um, but yeah, I these look like what I would call pyroform. And then the last one I have is kind of out of season. <laughs> this was, um, oops, where did it go? I don't see any pictures. 
Hmm. Uh. Well, hmm. let me look again. Let me try this one. It was in a pot. It was in a pot in the summer. Um, uh, see, there's some parsley not, not, in there. Not an amanita. Oh, it isn't? What is it? No, it's um, Leucocoprinus barnbamii. Okay. Leuco. Yeah, I think what it's is... Leucocoprinus, right? Luke, um, yeah, I... uh, Leucocoprinus, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. How do you spell oh, that? Only, only one I on the end. Okay. Oh, only Maybe. one? Oh, okay. How do you spell it? I'm yeah. not sure. I, I know, I know. Let me let me write it. Let me okay. It. Oh, so oh well I was okay, it's got the ring and it has a bulb. But um this is that something that grows around here? In pots all the time. It grows in flower pots and in gardens. <laughs> Oh in greenhouses and in greenhouses. Is it, greenhouses yeah. is it native to the area or has it been transported from somewhere That's else? Widespread. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was discovered somewhere in Europe in a greenhouse by a guy named Burbam or Burbami or something like that. I think he was Dutch. Yeah, yeah I, I just spoke to it's somebody today who fell in a right. flower pot in uh, Miami. Really? Mm -hmm. Now oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I was doing taxonomy on it. <laughs> nice. What did you say? Thing. Marius, what did you say? I missed it. Yeah, I was talking to someone in Florida, Miami, mm -hmm. uh, where they found this also in the in the potting soil of a pot that sat on the patio. Oh. I find I find them in my tarantula cages sometimes. <laughs> huh. Tarantula. Ooh. The, the tarantula doesn't eat them, does it? <laughs> no, but sometimes I throw um I throw mealworms in there to the tarantulas, and the tarantulas don't eat them; they pupate in the beetles, and I find the beetles eating them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, well that's all I had. Awesome. Interesting find. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Anybody else had anything they want to share? <laughs> I know Marisol said she wanted to come back to a gallerina, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Is yeah. there, is there yeah. anybody else? Yeah. So, go for go, oh, cool. go ahead. Go ahead. Fire it up, Marisol. Yeah. I have to open nine naturalist. Give me one second. Okay. Let me close this here. And open I naturalist. What is it? What is it? Oh, it's open. Okay. It's open, so now I need to share the screen. One second. All right, share the screen. Share the screen. Come on. All right. And oh my gosh. Oh, I got it. Okay. No. No, that one. Share the screen. This is close. Okay. Share the screen. Share the screen. Oh, I see. Oh, I got it. Okay. So, login. Oh no, Facebook. Okay. And then, Galina. Come on. It's loading. Oh, come on, please. Okay, I got it. Okay, so this is Gale. Can you see my motion? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is Galerina marginata or Galerina autumnalis. It's a synonym. And there was a bunch of them growing on a deciduous tree at the bank of a creek in the Pine Barrens. It was gorgeous. And this cap measured five centimeters was so beautiful. And it, this type was so long, I could not believe it. Wait, what happened there? 
Oh, there's another one in the same bunch. And because there were several of them, I have the, I could show you how it changes. So first the baby on the left, then it opens the gills, the veil ruptures, and then it's like almost here on the third photo in the right, it's covered with spores. I don't know if it will fall off. I have no idea about that. But you can see that the distance from the gills is, is bigger. And then here, this one had a very long stipe, like more than 10 centimeters, and it was very wide. I never saw one so robust galerina. Here are the spores. <laughs> and the um, global, the HIFA that makes up the flesh in the gills, like hot dogs, I used to call them like that. And this is the calocystidia, the large towards the base, but it very narrows below it. More of the calocystidia. More calocystidia. And the basidia with four for four uh, spores, although you could vaguely see that it's, it's hard, but it's four. Four stigmata are these parts where the spores are attached. I see Batman. Hmm? I see Batman. Oh. <laughs> and that's it. That's Galerina. And uh, can I show one more thing? Yeah, sure. Go go for it. Yeah, the same day I found the. I don't know if this is Erinaceus, uh, Marius. What do you think? Uh, can you just show the? Uh... Wait, I'm showing. It was. Yeah, it's the... definitely branched. Oh. Yeah. Oh wow! I never pay attention. So that the teeth are very long. Yeah, the teeth are long, but it's definitely branched. You sure that so it wasn't the... cut? Hmm? No, that's you sure that's... that wasn't cut. Scroll up a bit. So this one is the name that I no, proposed. It's, it's definitely branched. Where? Yeah, this is looks like it's nicely uh, desiccated, frozen also. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what the I was thinking, is... that, that this might just be damaged from cold weather. No, they... Because um... I, I always notice that. I always find them at the end of November around here starting to look really ratty from being frozen and stuff. Yeah, but uh, there's definitely uh, two clumps of the, um, of the, uh, the, the teeth. And um, is there a different angle on this? No, that's the only one. I think, it's, I think it's yeah. Aranasius. Oh, no, it, oh, Irinasius. I put Irinasius, but I don't know the difference when they say Americanus. I have no idea. Uh, Americanus does, has spines that don't get quite this long. And, yeah. oh. and you see a lot of clumps, too. There's like a lot of individual little clumps that oh. are bunched together. Yeah, then bunched oh, together, okay. they, they, they form the whole pom pom. But, the, uh, but then okay. you also have a branched version. Um, but yeah, ladies, like, like Luke said, it's just difficult on this one. Yeah, oh. this looks like maybe this one grew a little bit funny, broke in half or something while it was growing. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's... Something weird happened on the top. I can't make it. Yeah. sense of that. It's it may have frozen and split mm -hmm. and then thawed. Like, and there is a I hole in there. No. Yeah. On the tree. Can I do one more thing, if I may? Sure, go for it. We have 15 so, minutes off. So I don't uh, think anybody else more. has anything they want to do. And, so go ahead, just keep going. One more thing keep, that, keep, keep, keep it going, Marisol. <laughs> okay. And right here next to that 
all of these were in the um, Pine Barrens in, in Sui Road. So I found the two Ganodermas, two species of Ganoderma growing together. Oh, it's loading slowly. All right. So here you can see Ganoderma curtisi is on the top, and then Ganoderma lobatun is right underneath. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> that was so funny. So I removed the, I took this photo just to show you that they were coexisting. And then, oh, another angle for that. And then I removed, no yet, no yet. Uh, no, maybe not in this one. Oh, this is the first, what? The, poor surface of uh, Curtisi. But I have the observation for the Ganoderma lobato. Oh, I see, I see, it was next to it. So I remove the Ganoderma Curtisi from the top. And look, it's, this is intact. There's no relation between the two. And uh, the Poor surface for Lobatun is on the left, the poor surface for mm, Curtisi is on the right. Yeah, I, I showed the same photos just to show the relationship. Okay, right, that's good. Oops, what happened? Here? Stop share. All okay, right, thank you. Sure. All right. Is that it from everyone? Um, am I still on? Yeah. Hold on a minute. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. I'm, I'm looking up here on the um, book from Roger Phillips on that uh, Erykeum um, uh, that we just looked at. Uh, the thing that I was thinking about is Coriolis, but uh, uh, the correction is that's actually the European name for it. So the correct name for it's Ericum uh, Americanum. That's what I was thinking about is the branching, uh, what it called making the different clumps. That is, uh, but I was also thinking about the Coriolis. Yeah, but that's the, the one that looks like a comb. Yeah, but they're actually the same. That's what I just read now. No, nah, that's no. Phillips is wrong. There were there were, think that's a mistake in Phillips. Yeah, um, maybe. Yeah, no, it's that's been corrected. Um, okay. Yeah, there was a mistake in Phillips. There's a couple other little mistakes in Phillips like that as well. Yeah. So Americanum, I'm not sure they used the name Americanum back there. I think they were lumping together under the name Coralloides two different things or yeah, three okay. different things even. Um, but Americanum is the one that's clumps, and yeah. and the the spines are fairly long, not as long as Ericinius or Ericinium, Ericinius, I guess is. Yeah. Um, they're they're up to about maybe almost two centimeters long. The spines on Americanum, but Coralloides, and and it might be a different name now. I'm not sure, but it was Coral, but the one that was truly Coralloides, maybe only in Europe is it's these long sort of long branches with really short spines coming out usually oh, that's the european seven. version so the european version has the branches with the short spines well we have that too but oh, it okay. might be called something different in north america i'm not sure but we have one that's like that but and it's not called americanum it's called something else and i think it probably is called coral ladies I'd, I'd want to look it up but i think you want to get a more recent um um guide in order to, to research those names um because i the, the phillips guide goes back to like 1990s yeah, maybe the do. thing is it's a great book because i love the pictures in it and um and it's there it it's a big hardcover so i like to look at it even though i know the names are outdated and and things like that I and, still use it. And then I cross reference with other sources. Yeah, because I don't source. think there is any other book like that, really. No, it's a really good book. It's got it's a, a lot really of good stuff book. Yeah. It, uh, it helps me to do quick taxonomy sometimes. Yeah, but nice... you, have, you have to 
you have to cross reference with with um you know what you can just go to index fungorum and maybe see what kind of names are there and try to evaluate the author's names maybe and if they sound european or american sometimes you get a hint um and and look on mushroom observer search your name on mushroom observer and um the people there are that the names get updated very quickly on Mushroom Observer. They get updated pretty quickly on the Quebec site too. So yeah. if, even though it's in French, you might not be able to read everything that's there, but you'll still see the name and it'll be the Latin binomial. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yeah, had yeah. a lot of pictures too, a lot of pictures on the Quebec site. Yeah, good advice, thank you. All right. Hmm. I'm reading Brandon's uh, thing. It says, our second lobatum species name, lobate, lobatum, the specific epithet lobatum is derived from the Latin word lobus, meaning an elongated projection or protuberance, referring to the large lateral lobes of the labellum. Where'd you get that, Brandon? I'll just Google it real quick. Right, because so we were talking tonight about Sterium lobatum and then Ganoderma lobatum. So I know in the Sterium is referring to the constricted look to it, the constricted base, and how it projects outwards. And I guess the one that Marisol was just showing, lobatum, elongated projection. So lobatum, that one has, I'm just like, trying to decipher what they mean by that. That one, the one that Marisol was showing has the habit of regrowing every year underneath of the old one and like projecting a new lobe outward from underneath of the old fruiting body. Maybe that's what they mean. Yeah, anytime I see kind of like a frequency in the naming, I try to figure out what it means just to see if it can help me identify in the future. I wonder if there's any relation to lobotomy. <laughs> every time I try Well, to every time oh, lobotomy yeah. means to take out one lobe of your of your uh, uh, brain. Right. So uh, that's the relation, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, I looked up before I've looked up before what it meant in stereums and they were that's pretty much what they were talking about were lobes. All right, cool. Well, it's almost nine o'clock. Anybody else have anything they want to uh, jump into tonight before we call it a night? Nope. Cool. What, well, what's on the uh, menu for next Tuesday? <laughs> anything lined up? Well, I mean, if we have enough mushrooms, I mean, we had enough mushrooms tonight to spend two hours. So, I mean, we can, again, I did have queued up tonight, but we did, I mean, we're just about out of time now. So there's no point in getting into it. Um, if we had ran out of time or mushrooms, I had this queued up. I, I pulled up, this is um, an iNaturalist page for New Jersey. Okay. And these are all, um, these nice. are just observations. So you see there's almost 2000 pages <laughs> worth of mushrooms in New Jersey on iNaturalist. And um, we could just start pulling them up and taking a look at them. And, and not all of them are gonna be good, worth looking at, but I mean, I, I figure we could just, work our way through these things. Look, there's a bunch of steriums. You can tell it's late November now because you're starting to see a lot of steriums on iNaturalist. Like by by the way, those little yellow cups you just showed, that's a new genus name for those. Yeah, do they have that right? I, I, as far as I could tell, yes. I just oh, sinus citrina. Yeah, well, you have to do micro, really. There's a few other things. Yeah, I'm yeah. always hesitant on these things. Yeah, cause... yeah, yeah. Look at that wood. That wood's interesting. Look at those holes in there. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. going on there? Insects. Insects, yeah. Yeah. woodpeckers. Yeah, insects yeah. boring through. Yeah. I don't know about woodpeckers because these are really small it's mushrooms. It's too organized. It looks too organized. Look at the pattern. Yeah, yeah. it's insects boring through. They mm -hmm. were underneath the bark mm -hmm. before the bark fell mm -hmm. off. It's just interesting how organized they are. Look at these yep. streaks. At some point, I would be interested in hearing about people growing mushrooms, like Marius was saying 
you grew the herisium. So okay. if we run out of things, that might be interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that, that will probably end up being a lecture thing one night. Um, yeah, that's, so a, I, that's a lecture. There's a, I grow 17 different species. Yeah, that, I'm not sure if that falls really under the purview of uh, taxonomy. But um, mm -hmm. people could certainly, if you guys are interested in doing that, like you just need an organizer to wants to do it. And I'll give you guys the uh, passwords to, uh, you know, this is a group um, Zoom that we have here. If somebody wants to organize a cultivation night and you guys want to do it some night, I'll help you get the announcement out and all that. Okay, we can. Uh... You just need somebody, you just got to have somebody else to organize it. But anybody, anybody here is perfectly, uh, or full, fully welcome, I'm sure I should say, fully welcome to organize anything like that. So if you want to do that, just touch base with me. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, if we do like next week, if we run out of stuff to do, we can, if you guys feel like it, we can always go in here and just start working. Yeah. Some I like to do one time. Yeah. Because, you know, this stuff here that's coming up now is just recent stuff, but you can sort out dates. I mean, you can filter dates in here if you want to like look at spring stuff or summer stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm, that'd be nice. We never did that before. Yeah. Yeah, sounds cool. Yeah. All right. So. Penny, I wrote the name of the book on your direct message. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> what What do you mean? What book? The name about the polypores that you asked me. Oh, thank you. Polypores and similar fungi of Eastern and Central North America. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, everyone okay. have a great week. You too. Thank Get out you. There, find some mushrooms and I'll see everyone next week. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, Luke. Right, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.